Good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us online for our worship. Uh, today, St. Paul is going to teach us a little bit about freedom and formation in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's dig in with our opening song. We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We read responsively sections of Psalm 119, beginning at verse 153. Look on my affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget your law. Plead my cause and redeem me. Give me life according to your promise. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statutes. Great is your mercy, O Lord. Give me life according to your rules. Many are my persecutors and my adversaries, but I do not swerve from your testimonies. I look at the faithless with disgust because they do not keep your commands. Consider how I love your precepts. Give me life according to your steadfast love. The sum of your word is truth and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. We continue with our confession and forgiveness. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways 
to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And hear the good news of our loving Heavenly Father, for he indeed has had mercy upon us and has sent his Son Jesus to die for us. So in the stead and by the command of my Savior Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ten thousand arrows take flight Remind me that you are my armor There's always a place I can hide When I am desperate for shelter You're my covering I'm safe Oh, I'm safe And me, I'm safe. Oh, I'm safe. You've got me under your wings, under your wings. I'm under, I'm under your wings. You've got me, you cover me, you cover me. I'm under, I'm under your wings. With every step that I take, you are before and behind me. With every fear that I face, I am constantly finding You're my covering I'm safe, oh I'm safe Whatever comes at me I'm safe, oh I'm safe got me under your wings under your wings i'm under i'm under your wings you've got me you cover me you cover me i'm under i'm under your wings you got me under your wings under your wings i'm under i'm under your wings you've got me you cover me you cover me i'm under i'm under your wings you're my covering safe oh i'm safe whatever comes at me i'm safe oh i'm safe our epistle reading this morning comes from the book of romans chapter 7 verses 1 to 13. or do you not know brothers for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. Thus, a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is still alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, and if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve not under the old written code, but in the new life of the Spirit. What then shall we say, that the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, But when the commandment came, sin came alive, and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. Did that which is good, then, bring death to me? By no means. It was sin 
producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person, because he is a righteous person, will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Hey boys and girls, this is Deaconess Kim with a special message for our children. So let me ask you a question. Are rules good or bad? Sometimes that can be a hard question to answer, can't it? We don't always like being told what we can or can't do. But many rules are made for good reasons. They protect us by warning us about things that might hurt us or other people. Or they help us remember to be nice to other people by telling us not to be mean. So we know that rules are usually good. And God's rules, his law, is always good. But why do we have to have rules? So in this part of Romans that we read with the grown-ups, Paul is teaching us about God's rules, the law, and how it shows us our sin. It's kind of like this. Imagine for a minute that you're in a dark room. It is so dark, you can't see anything. Then you turn on a light, and you see that the room is filled with smelly clothes and broken toys and all kinds of things that you could trip over. If you had moved without the light on, you might have tripped or stepped on something and gotten hurt. But now that you have light, you can see all the bad stuff and it's easier to walk around. In fact, you can even start to clean things up so that there's not so much bad stuff in the way. Now sometimes our lives are like that dark room the smelly clothes and broken toys are sins and temptations, things that can hurt us and other people. God's law, his rules, that's the light. If we use the light, God's law, we can see all the bad things in our lives. We can try to avoid them so we don't get hurt or hurt other people. And we can try to clean it up so our lives aren't so messy with sin. But we can't do it by ourselves. The mess is just too big. And that's where Jesus comes in. He comes into our messy rooms and takes all that messy sin away. So just like the light in my story shows us how messy the room is, God's law shows us how messy we are because of sin. And so that's what Paul is teaching us here in Romans. All right, let's close with a prayer. Please bow your head, fold your hands, and repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for giving us your special rules. Help me see the mess in my life. Thank you for Jesus who takes my mess away. In Jesus' name, amen. There'll be no more waiting left for our souls One day there'll be no more children longing for home One day when the kingdom comes right here where we stand We will see the promised land One day there'll be no more lives taken too soon There'll be no more need for hospital rooms.
would say the fires would be wiped by his hand we will see the promised land hallelujah there'll be healing from this heartbreak we've been feeling we'll sing in the darkest night because we know when the light will come and there'll be healing hallelujah one day there'll be no more anger left in our the color of a skin won't cause a divide one day we'll be family standing hand in hand we will see the promised land hallelujah there'll be healing from this heartbreak we've been feeling we'll sing in the darkest night cause we know that the light will be healing hallelujah ooh, ooh, yeah. I believe there'll be healing hallelujah one day every knee will bow every tongue will confess one day when a tired and weary bones find their rest one day power of evil is brought to an end we will see the promised land hallelujah there'll be healing from this heartbreak we've been feeling we'll sing in the darkest night cause we know that the light will come and there'll be healing hallelujah be healing hallelujah there be healing hallelujah grace mercy and peace be to you from god our father and from our lord and savior jesus christ amen today we're jumping into romans chapter 7 and again we've been tracking with saint paul as he's been been moving us along in following jesus christ he established very strongly about our identity in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to the point where we should not be ashamed of the gospel because we know it is the power of God for salvation. Last week when we were digging a little bit more into chapter 6, we were really beginning to see our purpose, our purpose that we're living for the life to come, for that paradise. And, and last week I actually threw a challenge out for some people. That, that we would begin to start praying for people, praying for people that we want to be there with us in paradise with Jesus forever. Because we all know those names of people that need to know Jesus even better. So I invite you to continue with that challenge to, to be very specific about those names. Write, write those names on a piece of paper, maybe write it on your phone. Uh, one thing that I do specifically is I have an alarm that goes off on my phone at 10.02. That 10.02 is connected to Luke chapter 10, verse 2, which talks specifically about when Jesus said that we should be praying for the Lord of the harvest. And so it, it really brings an impact in knowing that, that it's God, the one that's using you and I, to bring others into his kingdom too. So when we think of it in that way, we begin to see and connect with the power of God because we know that the only way that someone is going to come to believe in Jesus Christ anyway, and St. Paul reminds us of that too, is that if it's Jesus that brings them into his kingdom. In fact, the last verse that we looked at last Sunday was Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. I give you this little chart because this is something I hope that we all get familiar with because it's an easy way to draw uh, for our non-believing friends or family that they can get a, a very clean picture of what this new life in Christ is all about, how it, how it starts. You see it clearly drawn out here that it's, it's only through Jesus 
that we can have this new life. St. Paul wants to make sure that we don't get this law and gospel thing mixed up in our scripture lesson today. For we see that the Romans were having some confusion in this particular area. Now, we as Lutherans have always taught about these two great teachings, right? The, the law and the gospel. And, and let's not get that mixed up because indeed the law has always been intending to bring us to the point where we see our sin, our, 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 our standing before God and trust in the gospel. And then the gospel is the thing that frees us so that we know that we have life in Christ that Jesus is our all, that he died for us, that he loves us, that he is living in, on high and sending his spirit into our lives each and every day so that we can live for him. You see, this is the power of the gospel. And St. Paul wants us to, to dig into this power of the gospel. Considering the following story of Vincent Van Gogh, for a year... Vincent had been in a mental asylum in southern France. At times, he was allowed outdoors on the grounds, accompanied by an attendant. At other times, he was confined to the building, painting scenes he saw through his window in his room. Van Gogh was disturbed, not only by the confines of his room, but also by the confines of his mind. He suffered seizures and mental distress. Where could Van Gogh fo go for relief? Into his suffering and confinement came a letter, small but powerful. It came from his brother Theo. Theo sent Van Gogh a copy of an etching by Rembrandt. In that letter and in that etching, Van Gogh discovered life and hope. The picture that Theo sent was Rembrandt's fifth etching of The Raising of Lazarus. In it, Jesus stands there, a ruling figure, towering, powerful, looking out over the scene. At his feet, Lazarus is coming out of the tomb. No one looks at Jesus. All eyes are on Lazarus as he rises from the grave. Yet Jesus stands there, the resurrection and the life. He is the resurrecting Christ. From him comes all power, the power over death and the power of life. In his rule, he raises Lazarus, opening the eyes of all to see the power of God. When Van Gogh received this picture, he was inspired by its power. He remembered the etching. He remembered what had been written about it. But when he looked at it, he saw more than could ever be written. He pondered it and painted it and sent his brother a letter with his own small etching, trying to put into words what he saw. Here, in the suffering and confinement of the asylum, Van Gogh experienced the power of the resurrecting Christ. Written in letters, painted on canvas, the resurrecting Christ brought life and hope and beauty into the world. In St. Paul's letter to the Romans, he proclaims the power of the resurrecting Christ. He knew it personally in his life because Jesus had transformed his life completely and had given him purpose in life, serving in the freedom of Jesus Christ. St. Paul wanted those Romans to understand that same resurrecting Jesus Christ, the life-changing aspect of what Christ could do for, for life. St. Paul also wants us to see this, this power too, Christ's changing power, his ability to, to renew and to restore us, strengthen us, for our service to him in life. And not only that, it's that same resurrecting power that lives in you and in me that changes lives that are around us too. St. Paul finishes his letter with, with these words, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. May the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. See, that's the amazing power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But sometimes it's, it's easy to get lost in where power truly comes from. 
Like, like for example, the picture of Rembrandt, when, when all the eyes are looking at Lazarus, instead of looking to the one who has life, the one that has the resurrecting power, Jesus Christ. I mean, it's easy to see how that happens in the world as the world chases after so many different things in which they, they feel will give them life or give them power or satisfaction or happiness or, or what have you. But see, even in the church, we can lose track of what truly brings power in our lives. Rome had a problem with this. They, they, they went back to the law to find, to find life in God's law. And in fact, they ended up twisting it completely. Maybe perhaps an, an example of that would be somebody that, that brings their son to Sunday school because they want them to learn good moral teachings. They want them to learn the Ten Commandments rather than bringing them here to, 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 to gain a, a deeper understanding of their relationship with their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Certainly the law is good, but, but when you hold on to the law like, like you're holding on to a knife, it cuts you. See, that's what the law does, is it, is it shows us how deep our sin truly is, how far our separation from God truly is. So unless we realize our, our, our sinful condition and, and the shape that that leaves us in, we can simply lose, lose track, even here in the church. You see, Jesus is the one that is holding on to us while we were dying. He holds on to us to free us from the guilt of the law, to free us from its standard frees us so that we can follow and serve him faithfully. This has always been the life that we have been called to as God's people. Even in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 6, described what we, would, what we should be doing, how we should be passing this faith off to our children, that, that God's laws, his instructions, they were good for us, they were good for the world, that they should bind them on themselves, to, to put them as, uh, on their eyelids so that they were constantly in front of them so that they knew exactly what they were to be as God's people. You see, when God's people lived their lives for Him, they were the shining lights to the rest of the world. And that, that when the others that were around them saw how they were living their lives, they would bring honor and glory to their heavenly Father, and that it would bring all of them, all of the nations together, to see the life that God has in store for all and one day that we will truly see. Considered how Van Gogh's life was changed. When Van Gogh looked at the etching by Rembrandt, he couldn't put what he saw into words. He tried, but he couldn't find the words. Instead, Van Gogh painted his own raising of Lazarus. Based on a small detail in this etching, Van Gogh focused in on the figure of Lazarus rising from the grave. Martha is pulling the veil from his eyes, and Lazarus is only beginning to see the world again. Jesus is not even in the painting. He stands as the ruling figure in the background, not seen by Lazarus, not seen by his sisters, not seen by the viewer, but known to be there. What is seen, however, is amazing. If you look closely at the face of Lazarus rising from the grave, you see that Van Gogh painted himself into Lazarus. There he is, a thin, pale man with a red beard, rising from the grave, not yet able to see all that God has done for him, not yet able to see Jesus ruling over all, only beginning to live 
to taste the wonder of the resurrecting Christ in his flesh in this world. Team Jesus, what a beautiful picture. Can, can you picture that in your own life? Can you see the life that you live in the same way that, that Van Gogh saw it? Life in the resurrecting Christ. We have a lot of things that we're facing in this world today and, and a lot of troubles and, and, I, and I know that the world throws a million things at us that are, are depressing and, and attempting to drag us down and, and all of that, but we, we know the source. We know that Satan is behind all of it. But our resurrecting Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is victorious over all of this. You see, in Christ we are free. We are free from the burden of the law. We are free from the burden of fear. We are free to live our life in the power of our resurrecting Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when we do that, the world will know of a better way. Amen. And may the peace which surpasses our human understanding guard your hearts and keep your minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen. Hopefully by now you know how to continue contributing your tithes and offerings to the Lord's kingdom work. We will continue to post these slides during our offering time. A prayer I often recite during our offering time comes from the Lutheran hymnal, hymn 441. We give thee but thine own, whate'er the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. May we continue to be faithful in being good stewards of his gifts. Go team. Our announcements for this Sunday. Just a reminder of our fun flicks and fellowship. Next event would be Thursday, July 16th. Again, Kung Fu Panda. More information in your Team Jesus News. Also, this uh, year we'll do a virtual VBS uh, with our sister congregation, King of Kings. It'll be July 13th through the 17th. There is information in your Team Jesus News about how to get signed up and register to get the materials that you would need. If you have any questions, you certainly can call the church office or Deaconess Kim. Also, just not to forget, we've got our Sunday school and Bible classes that are taking place online. Uh, lots of opportunities to still grow in your walk with your Lord during this pandemic. At this time, we'll make confession of our Christian faith to the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This morning on our prayers, we want to continue to pray for Kim Gladden in her battle with cancer. Also prayers for Mike Sullins, uh, has swelling in his tongue, and he's uh, getting further testing uh, at the Mayo Clinic. Prayers for Sam Greider as he was hospitalized after having some seizures. Uh, prayers for, continued prayers for Jeannie Hill's cousin Brooks uh, from the motorcycle accident. Uh, still a lot of complications and recovery with that. Prayers for Pam Witt and Margaret Yoakum as both of their facilities uh, again have been hit with the coronavirus and just continued prayers for the pandemic uh, that we're facing. Prayer of Thanksgiving as uh, Dominic Rodriguez, my grandson, is being baptized this afternoon. Um, and uh, just continue to pray for all those that have lost loved ones to the coronavirus and just uh, during during this difficult time without uh, being able to have funerals uh, the way we do. So let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, we pray that you would bless and watch over your church on earth. Help her to be a powerful witness to your love and mercy through her actions. 
We pray the same for our church, that we will be a blessing to those in liberty. Guide the leaders of this world, and especially our nation. Grant peace and justice for all people, so that your gospel may be heard. Watch over those who serve in our armed forces, especially those in dangerous places. Send your angels to guard and care for them, and bring them home safely to their families. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Great physician of body and soul, we thank you for all who work with you to bring healing to the sick, relief to the to the disabled and comfort to the suffering. Help us never to forget that you are the source of all healing. Intervene for good in the lives of those among us who are hurt and in need of healing. Especially we pray for Kim, for Mike, for Sam, for Brooks, for Pam, and for Margaret, and all those affected by the coronavirus. Receive our thanks for the healing which you have already provided among us. Please be with those mourning the death of loved ones, especially any that are related to the pandemic at this time. Death is certainly a reminder to us all to be ready for our final call. Keep us always in your saving faith where we find comfort in the certain hope of the resurrection of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of life, you called us to be your own through the power of baptism. Help us daily to remember that you have made us your children in baptism. We celebrate with Dominic, Paisley, Danielle, Lane, Mason, Carl, Jerry, David, Aubrey, Bryn, and Georgia as they celebrate their baptismal birthdays. Keep them and all of us in your baptismal promises. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, loving Father who instituted, ordered, and blessed the estate of marriage between a man and a woman, we give you thanks and praise for this most precious gift. You care deeply about marriage and a promise to be the cord that binds marriage together. So we rejoice with Jim and Olivia, Stacy and Lori, Jeff and Sue, Kelly and Nancy, as they celebrate another wedding anniversary. Continue to bless and strengthen them and all of our marriages. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give to you his peace. Amen. The other day I was thinking to myself, made a list of all my mistakes. Oh, I wish I could have run to you, tell you all about my heartbreak. And I wondered to myself, wait a minute, am I even on the right path now? Had a couple wins, but I got knocked down. But I know that you were here right now, and you'd say, ooh, sometimes you lose, sometimes you win. Ooh, you gotta get up, up again. Ooh, keep holding on, it's not the end. Gotta get up, up again. Ooh, you can get up, up again. Ooh, you can get up, up again. Guess not every little thing works out just the way you dreamed. You can take a couple wrong turns, still end up where you're supposed to be. Even though in a moment I know everything can change Your perfect plans might fall apart But simple truth remains Ooh, sometimes you lose, sometimes you win Ooh, you gotta get up, up again Ooh, keep holding on, it's not the end Gotta get up, up again. Ooh, you can 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 get up, up again. Cause you've only got one life, and you 
don't know where it ends You've only got one heart So get out there and live Yeah, you've only got one life Don't let it get away Everyone falls down But you can get up, up again Get up, up again. Ooh, you can get up, up again. Guess not every little thing works out just the way you dreamed. You can take a couple wrong turns, still end up where you're supposed to be.